All right, let's get started, shall we? Welcome everyone, um, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Housing Element 101 session for Akalani's Valley and Happy Valley. It's one of several uh, neighborhood um, info sessions that the city has hosted and will continue to host to provide information on the housing element and the state requirements that we are um, obligated to address. I believe this is the second to last of our housing element 101 run. So it's, it's been pretty good so far. Um, the highlight of today's agenda is the Q and A questions and answers. And it's important to note that even though we've had several general plan advisory community meetings ready and a handful of housing element 101 sessions, we are still in the information stage of the housing element and we're still at the beginning. So we plan on providing information at tonight's meeting and answering your questions to the best of our, our ability, because our game plan for tackling the housing element and any or the remaining elements of the general plan is to first inform, uh, then then engage, and then decide. Um, so how about we start off with some introductions? We'll go staff first, and then we'll work our way to our GPAC members. Um, I'm Jonathan Fox. I'm an assistant planner with the city of Lafayette, and I've been with the city for a couple of years now. My name is Renata Robles. I'm also a planner with the Lafayette Planning Department, and I've been with the city for a little over a year. I'm Greg Wolf, the planning director. I've been with the city for 24 years. I'm Diana Elrod. I'm the city's housing consultant, and I've been working for the city uh, for about 16 years, including through, this is, I think, our th my third housing element cycle. And uh, Mike Kim. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Kim. Uh, I'm your GPAC representative for Happy Valley and Akalani's Valley. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've lived in Lafayette for uh, 23 years with my wife, Sarah, and our children. Um, for work, I work for a large global uh, infrastructure development placemaking firm headquartered out of Sydney, Australia. Um, some of you may know that my family also own uh, Sienna Ranch, which is at the very end of Deer Hill Road. And it's an experiential learning facility for generally for the youth, where we try to provide a very you know, safe, wholesome environment um, for kids to experience the outdoors. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Chris. Is that right? Hi, I'm Chris Lee. I'm the chair of GPAC. Uh, I've lived in Lafayette for 25 years. My husband and I moved from San Francisco. And one of our main goals was to be able to walk to BART. So I live uh, 18 minutes from the BART station. Uh, we can walk. <laughs> um, we also have a business in downtown Lafayette. Uh, we were, are members of the Chamber of Commerce. Our son went to Burton Valley and um, I uh, welcome you all tonight. And I'm very interested in hearing uh, your feedback on our presentation and also your questions. Terrific, thank you all for the introductions. So now we'll move on to the staff presentation portion of the agenda, which is a video that we've prepared to uh, set the stage and provide an introduction to the housing element. So I'll share my screen and audio. Uh, feel free to adjust the volume on your end. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm a planner with the City of Lafayette, and today's video will serve as an introduction to the housing element of the general plan. We'll cover state law requirements like the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, RENA, the BART Rezoning Bill, AB 2923, local housing needs, the timeline that we're working with, and most importantly, community engagement. Feel free to click the timestamps below if you're interested in a particular topic, or you can join us for the entire video. Let's get started. <music> This is the Lafayette Design Project. Published in 1961, it set the stage for decades of careful planning to envision how Lafayette would grow. 
The community's current master plan, also known as the General Plan, was adopted 41 years later in 2002. The new General Plan will be the blueprint for how Lafayette will look, feel, and grow over the next 20 years. It will determine how the city shapes decisions on everything from growth, land use, housing, circulation, open space, noise, safety, and infrastructure. While these topics are discussed in separate chapters called Elements in the General Plan, they are all interrelated and together they will shape growth and development policies for the next two decades. So think about this. 20 years ago, when we last did our general plan, there were no cell phones. There was no internet. And so we need to update this. And the things that are new to refresh is we have climate change, for example. We have new overflow traffic from Highway 24, from uh, mobile apps. We have uh, diversity and equity and inclusion issues that we want to include in this new general plan. Lafayette's last comprehensive general plan update was completed in 2002 with a 20 to 25 year horizon. The City Council has initiated this current update to address the current and future needs and values of the community. The current general plan encourages the development of a variety of housing for people of all incomes, preservation of neighborhoods, and housing opportunities for all, regardless of race, age, gender, sexual orientation, marital status, or national origin. Over the next four years, a volunteer-led committee of Lafayette residents, called the General Plan Advisory Committee, will be looking to you, residents, employees, property and business owners, and visitors, to let them know what they need to consider as they update the general plan. The process includes an intensive engagement effort with many ways to get involved. The GPAC and city staff will be hosting public meetings and informational sessions, community workshops, surveys, quizzes, walking tours, and much more. The city is at the beginning stages of the general plan update process, and the first step is the housing element. And the housing element gives us a chance to chart our course going forward in terms of how we want to have housing change and adapt in the years ahead. And in that, there's a challenge and there's also an opportunity. And the challenge is primarily the state's mandate to increase the housing supply in California. And we, like every city in this state, have a mandate to come up with more housing. The California Department of Housing and Community Development, or HCD, sets the number of housing units a regional government needs to plan for in the next eight years. These eight-year periods are called cycles, and we are currently in the fifth cycle, preparing for the sixth. The state issues overall numbers to each region, and each region allocates numbers to each local jurisdiction. This is called a Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or RHNA, pronounced RENA. In Lafayette's case, HCD gives a number to the Association of Bay Area Governments, known as ABAG, who then develops a methodology by which each jurisdiction in the nine-county Bay Area will receive its allocation. The city is not required to build this number of units. The market does that. Rather, the city must ensure there's enough land zoned at appropriate densities to accommodate the arena. The overall number is split into four income categories, very low, low income, moderate income, and above moderate income. What do these terms mean, and what is affordable housing? In Contra Costa, the medium income for a household of four was $119,200. A very low income household of four would make 50% or less of this amount. A lower income household at 51 to 80%, a moderate income household at 81 to 120 percent, and an above moderate income household over 120 percent. Almost all of the housing built in Lafayette are in the above moderate income category. Lafayette's reallocation for the fifth cycle housing element was 400 units. Given the statewide shortage of housing, particularly affordable housing, the Bay Area's allocation has more than doubled for the sixth cycle, and Lafayette's draft allocation is expected to be 2,100 units. ABAG will issue updated allocations in the spring of 2021 once HCD signs off on the draft methodology adopted by ABAC. State law requires that the housing element contain a site-by-site -site inventory of land suitable for development of all housing types, including multifamily. As has been the case for the last two housing elements, staff has conducted a citywide review of parcels that are either vacant or underutilized to discern if these sites are appropriate for development. These sites may or may not be developed into housing, as the choice and always will be the owner's decision. Some factors considered in the development of the site inventory include, but are not limited to, whether a site has an underperforming use on it, whether the site's topography makes it suitable for housing development, and whether the site is of sufficient size to be developed for housing. To meet its housing goals, the city will need to increase densities in several areas of the city. This is also known as upzoning. Let's take the downtown for example, a majority of which has a density of 35 dwelling units per acre. This means on a one acre parcel, a developer can build a maximum of 35 dwelling units whether apartments, townhomes, or condominiums. 
Upzoning involves changing the zoning designation of a parcel to allow for an increase in dwelling units per acre. How that increased density looks depends on a number of factors, including existing design standards, the size of the lot, and the size of the units. Upzoning any parcel in the city is expected to garner some level of public interest. Does the city concentrate development in downtown? Should density be evenly distributed across the city? Or should we only increase density near BART? Where, how, and to what extent the city increases density to accommodate the plus 2,000 units will be a key conversation for the housing element update. AB 2923, signed into law by the governor in 2018, requires that properties owned by BART around its stations be upzoned by local jurisdictions to at least 75 dwelling units per acre and at least five stories in height by July 1st, 2022. The BART parking lots totaling about 11 acres on Deer Hill Road will need to be upzoned to accommodate approximately 825 units, or these units will have to be built somewhere else. Rezoning these parcels for compliance with AB 2923 will also aid in reaching our RENA allocation. The housing element will discuss much, much more than just the state law requirements like AB 2923 and RENA. It's also a great opportunity to come together, look at our existing housing stock, and assess our needs moving forward. The community will collaborate on programs to expand housing opportunities to those with lower incomes, seniors, persons with disabilities, and the homeless. It's an opportunity to brainstorm ways to incentivize developers to include more affordable housing in their projects and to help promote the construction of accessory dwelling units. The reason the housing element is being updated first is because Lafayette must submit its draft housing element to the state by the end of 2022. The housing element is the only piece of the general plan that is legally required to be certified by the state. HCD will review the proposed goals, policies, and programs to ensure Lafayette is doing its part to create safe, stable, and affordable housing opportunities for all segments of the population. 2022 may sound far away, but there's a lot to do before then, including gathering community input, drafting the document, getting feedback from the public, and conducting environmental review. If the city does not have a certified housing element, Lafayette could lose more local control over how and where housing projects get built, and could lose out on funding for infrastructure projects, receive substantial fines, and more. The general plan update is going to affect every member of the community, so we put a high priority on reaching every stakeholder possible. So we'll, we'll know we have a good housing element when the community has really had a chance to work through the process, to learn about it, to talk about it, to work through the complexities of it with their neighbors, uh, including those constraints of state law requirements, um, and then ultimately to have come together for a collaborative solution. Opportunities to learn more about the housing element and provide input on the process are just beginning. The city has scheduled the number of info sessions based on geographic region and interest group in the city, so please pay attention to those. Feel free to visit planlafia.org for those login details, and also visit our engagement platform, Engagement HQ, to participate in our weekly activities like polls, surveys, quizzes, and mapping activities. Thanks for joining us in the housing element video, and we will continue with the general plan. And I think that um, Lafayette rises to the occasion, and I'm sure we'll come up with something that works well for our community. All right, everyone, thank you for sticking with us and watching that intro to the housing element. Uh, let's move on to really the bulk of tonight's meeting, and that's the Q&A session. Uh, Q&A meaning question and answer. So um, we, a couple things to note, we, we have around 70 people in, uh, as attendees in tonight's meeting. So um, when we bring in attendees to become panelists, we'd appreciate if questions are concise um, and questions are actually questions. So there are opportunities to provide comments and to provide ideas and feedback. And we certainly need all of that feedback. And we've created a place just for that. It's um, our digital engagement platform, uh, Engagement HQ, which you can navigate to through planlafayette.org. I'll show how to get to that a little bit later. Uh, but tonight's focus is questions from our attendees and responses from our panelists. So um, Renata will bring in our panelists and feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. So first we have Kathy Merchant. Hi, Kathy, you're in the meeting. If you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question. I did not intend to ask a question, so. 
Okay, and so I, I was going to say, however, that Chris has been doing a fantastic job at all of these. That's what I was really going to going to say. But no question, I'm just listening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, just one moment. All right, uh, we have Donovan Jenkins. Hi, Don. You are in the meeting. If you'd like okay, to I'm, and here I am. There we go. Uh, just a question in regards to the West End. Uh, I'm curious as to what plans uh, people might have in regards to the uh, property opposite the Oakwood, the 60 acres. Is that uh, currently R10 zoning or how is that uh, currently zoned? Um, happy to look it up, but it is uh, either LR5 or LR10. So um, the single family residential districts all begin with the R designation for residential and are followed by a, a number, be it 10, 20, 40, and that indicates a minimum lot size of 10,000 square feet, 20,000 square feet, 40. LR, uh, by contrast, is uh, shown by the uh, number of acres you would need to uh, achieve a, a yield. So the, the, Oak, the property across from Oakwood is about 60 acres. Uh, it's owned by De Silva um, and it is zoned LR10. So um, you would need 10 acres for each dwelling unit as currently zoned. Thank you. Thank you, Don. So next we have David Clark. All right, David. Hi, hi, everybody. Go ahead and ask Thank your you. question. Thanks, Renata. Um, I've been playing with some of these numbers, as, as Renata, as you pointed out last night. I'm not getting them right all the time, but um, I, I have two questions. I think they're both fairly quick. But I, um, I went online and looked at the uh, major project website or the major project section of the website, and, and I created a simple spreadsheet. And I went through and listed all the properties that were on there, all the units that were involved, and all the below market units that were described. On that, on that site. And um, there are six properties on there that have no below market or affordable units indicated. They, they come out at, at zero. My question is, are they correctly zero? And I can, I can tell you which six those are. Um, it's 942 doing a project called Chestnut Townhomes, Lenar Homes 6, Samantha Townhomes, and Valley View. A couple of those are pretty small, so maybe it's a size issue, but Valley View is, shows 42 units. My, so that question is, are those zeros correct? And if so, how do you achieve those zeros or why are they zero? Um, and a, a second question, which may or may not be related, but what I was trying to get to by looking at those, by putting that, by arraying those numbers was what the below market percentage is across the board. If you, if you take those numbers and add them up, now granted, some of, those, some of them are zero, the percentage is a little over 17%. And what I was trying to figure out was, is that number going up because of state density bonus law? It's hard to tell because there aren't any dates on that chart. So that, that part of it's hard to tell. But it occurs to me that another way to achieve more um, affordable housing is to change the inclusion ratio. So my second question is, is there any, will there be a consideration to changing the I think that's the right term, the inclusion ratio um, from what I think is currently 15% to something higher. So those two, why the zeros? And then is there any consideration in the process going forward to increase the, uh, in the inclusionary ratio? I think there were a couple other questions in there too, David. If, uh, thank you for those. And um, you, you, we can always count on you. I think you're attending all of these, which is great. You're getting so engaged and informed and, and um, you, you're right. We will be bringing forward uh, to GPAC uh, and sharing out the kind of historic production that has happened over the last 10, 20 years. Um, you did it yourself. You went online to our major projects page and, and called those numbers out. Um, 
some of those you point out are small projects and, and thus do not trigger the city's inclusionary housing, uh, which kicks in at seven units. Um, so yes, some of those should be zeros. Um, Samantha townhomes should not be a zero. I believe that's a two, Jonathan, I think that, yes, Correct. thank you. Two. Um, that, that's two BMR units and BMR is below market rate. So when that term is used, it means that the, the sales price or rental price is restricted through a deed restriction to um, affordable income levels as prescribed by the state um, based on number of bedrooms and household size. Um, so Samantha townhomes should have two and 10, um, two BMR and 10 market rate. Um, and Valley View, uh, should be a zero. And the reason for that is even though it's 42 units um, and was approved, but not yet under construction, it was a fully rental project. And state law at the time prohibited local jurisdictions from uh, getting involved in setting rental prices, uh, the Contra Costa Hawkins Act, not Contra Costa Hawkins, Costa Hawkins Act. Um, that, that has been revised and amended and now cities uh, are able to uh, have inclusionary housing applied to rental housing. And so the city, as soon as that, that was available to the city, we, we did that. Uh, so your one question there was, um, is that percentage, you, you calculated 17%, um, so is, is that percentage going up because of state density bonus law? I don't know that it would. The Lafayette's uh, inclusionary uh, percentage is 15%. Um, some developers are going above that to 20 or, or more percent um, invoking state density bonus law. Um, but, you know, they, they're also getting more market rate units. And so the, I, I don't believe that the math would calc out to uh, have a higher percentage. So you rightly point out that the city has, since 1994, when the redevelopment agency formed, uh, had an inclusionary housing requirement for multifamily in the downtown. 15% um, of the units are, are restricted to be BMR, must be produced as BMR below market rate. Uh, so, and historically for the for sale has been 6% very low, 9% low or moderate. Um, and so it, it I think as part of the general plan update process and the housing element, it, it behooves us to look at um, a potential program which would have the city evaluate uh, the inclusionary housing program and whether 15% should, should be bumped up. That is an option. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you, David. So we will bring in a caller next. Hello. You are in the meeting if you would like to ask your question. This is, this is, sorry, this is Jim, right? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, I, I didn't get the full message. I don't think it was me. But in any case, okay, Jim Rule, Orchard Road, couple of things. Um, so Cam Burks said, um, I'll make it quick, don't worry. Cam Burks said at the meeting earlier this week that Lafayette should fight back. Everybody go Google the HCD. So basically you have a state organization telling all of us that have worked for 35 years or what have you, that we have to listen to a group of 12 people guiding us on what the rules are. Um, also in regard to the presentation by Jonathan, he explicitly said that the BART parking lot has to be rezoned. My question would be, according to what the mayor said also this week, I do not believe that is any longer the case. So I'll make the comment, everybody go check out HCD if you wanna relinquish your hard-earned uh, right. You, did you have a question, Jim? 
I, I heard a question in um, with respect to the bar parking lots and and whether the city is required to uh, rezone those or upzone those. Um, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is that AB twenty nine twenty three, the the bill that was signed into law, has a provision that allows a local jurisdiction to not upzone land which qualifies under AB 2923 uh, if that land is in a very high fire hazard severity zone, which this is. So that gives us the option of not upzoning that, but it does require that we would need as a community to find uh, somewhere else to put the, the level of development that would go uh, based on BART's TOD standards um, that would go there if we choose not to do it there, then we would need to find some somewhere else in the community to do that. My so my premise would be why why or my question would be why go on the premise that we're going to rezone it? That's been the working standard from every meeting that I've heard. I'd say hold on. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. So next we will bring in Jane Mackey. Hi, Jane, you are in the meeting. Please feel free to ask your question. Great, thanks so much. So um, I know that the city knows about some or even many of the ADUs that exist around um, the city. And I know there, I remember that there was some sort of amnesty program five years ago that allowed people to, I think have their ADUs go on record without having to pay the permit fees and such. So I, my question is, um, does the planning department have any kind of estimate of how many you know, illegal or unregistered ADUs there are out there in the city? And is, if not, is there some way you could figure that out? And how would that play into meeting the requirements of, um, you know, of the state? Um. Great question. Do we have a, a, a estimate as to the number of uh, unpermitted ADUs out there? We we really don't. We we don't have much information to go on. I mean, on occasion you'll see something in a in a listing um, with you know describing a, a granny flat or a, a um, au pair unit um, that you know, wasn't permitted initially. And so the, the amnesty program, which the city launched a few years ago, was largely um, superseded by changes in uh, state law um, uh, housing package that uh, three particular bills that kind of uh, got combined and changed housing law in, in some complex ways, but the, the short of it is that it made it very much, much easier to um, get permits for ADUs um, and junior accessory dwelling units as well. Um, and so there are provisions under that for um, essentially legalizing on uh, previously unpermitted uh, ADUs. So it's gotten to be, um, we have three classes of accessory dwelling units um, that fit different categories, um, A, B, and C, and A and B are over the counter. C is um, kind of minimally uh, ministerial. So there's no public hearings, there's no design review process. Um, it, it's very straightforward. So we do have that information on the website under uh, on our page dedicated to ADUs. Um, so hopefully I answered your question, uh, but with respect to whether, so we have noticed a market uptick um, based on that housing package going in, the changes that, that the state required and we um, implemented locally, a significant uptick in the number of ADUs, uh, new construction and, and conversion. Um, so that those numbers can count towards and, and do count towards the housing production um, in the community. 
And, and Diana could probably speak to kind of any nuance about if it's been an existing unit and whether HCD would allow us to uh, count that as a, a new unit. It's unlikely. Um, basically, they're going, the, the rule of thumb is that they're going for uh, new construction of units. Um, it, for the same reason that, generally speaking, it's very difficult to count the preservation of units, like an apartment building that's made affordable, like permanently affordable, because the rules for those kinds of things are so onerous that m basically most jurisdictions can never meet them those requirements. So I would say that the ones that might be quote unquote an amnesty wouldn't probably count, uh, but we can count new, typically new units that we are uh, going forward that um, people for, for, for whom people apply for a permit. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we will bring in Martha Clark. Hi, Martha, you are in the meeting. Uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Great, just a moment. Uh, there we go. Hi, how are you? Um, uh, in the, first, first of all, thank you all for what you do. This is a very hard job. I can't believe you signed up for it, but good on you um, and good luck to you. Uh, you mentioned in the video that um, infrastructure was a, uh, part of the general plan. And my question is really around um, how that the infrastructure impact of um, various housing plans are, are counted. So is it after the fact you figure out the housing element and then you just figure out what infrastructure goes with it? Or are you looking at the infrastructure impact of different options of how you could put that, that housing element together? Um, so, and, and so I'm just trying to get a sense of, uh, you know, what's the philosophy around the infrastructure implications of this? Is it to minimize it or is it just an afterthought in terms of uh, we have to do this if that's what the housing element is? Um, so the, the housing element will require a, an environmental impact report. And in that analysis, it will look at the at, at uh, infrastructure and city services um, to uh, an, an impact that housing growth would have on those. Um, one example is parks. The, the more um, residents that you have, the, the more need and demand for parks and recreational facilities, and, and certainly all of the, all of the utilities. Um, and the, the EIR will look at schools, but there are different rules about different aspects. Um, so with respect to schools, state law has, uh, state law is such that the um, mitigation for a, a project's impact um, on the, the schools um, is all, all that local jurisdictions, all rather all that the school district can do is charge an impact fee. Um, so, and that has been in place for many, many years in, in uh, the Lafayette school districts. Um, so when new development occurs, the developers pay into that fee and that fee is intended per the state law to pay for those new facilities that would be required to serve those students. Um, similarly, we've had impact fees associated with um, sub-regional traffic mitigation, park land acquisition, park facilities, um, walkways. Um, I'm probably forgetting one or two, but that, so every, every new unit, uh, including, well, every new unit, um, when it is permitted to be built, is obligated to, to pay those uh, impact fees. So um, it may not always be enough to, to build certain things, but um, there, there is some mechanisms that the state law allows uh, to um, help fund the, the new infrastructure. Um, state law also explicitly uh, 
disallows jurisdictions from using what is called level of service um, at uh, traffic level of service at intersections. So essentially it's a measure of delay um, and how many you know, traffic signal uh, cycles you might need to, to wait through. Um, that has historically been used as a metric, you know, um, and, and, and one mechanism gives it a letter grade, A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, and so state law says you can no longer use that LOS level of service in an environmental review um, for under the California Environmental Quality Act. You must use what is called vehicle miles traveled, VMT. And I think from a very high level, it is uh, intended to reduce greenhouse gases. So transportation sector being one of the two, top two sectors of production of greenhouse gases, uh, VMT, um, reducing overall VMT and the, and the target currently is 15% um, reduction. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. So next we'll be bring in Jeremy Levine. Oh, and while Jeremy's coming in, um, I invite any of the team to correct me if I say something incorrectly or to add additional detail or nuance, and I will try to short my answers a little bit. Um, I do have to leave at seven to go to my next city meeting. Um, so I'll leave the rest of the team here to, to continue on. Um, hello, Jeremy. Howdy. Um, you have all been doing an excellent job, so thank you for your work. I am curious, at the last city council meeting, the city was talking about um, approving various draft scenarios to send to the environmental uh, impact consultant that we are going to, that, that we need to, to review the areas that we recommend for upzoning. And it sounded like the city council has final authority over where the um, where, where upzoning will be studied, um, and I, I just wanted to clarify: is that true, or does the GPAC get to decide where the city is going to study potential upzoning and its impacts? That's question one. I have another, but but I'll leave that open. Well, I'll address that one first. Um, ultimately, the city council, as the, the five elected officials, uh, do have the, the final say, essentially, on any decision in, in the community, um, inclusive of direction to the environmental consultant on what to study. And so just for the, for the rest of those on the call, um, what was discussed on Monday night and will be discussed again on August 12th is... Um, we have to kind of in parallel with this effort that we are going through with outreach and education and then gathering input and uh, coalescing that um, and bringing it to GPAC and, and ultimately coming up with a, a plan, a, a housing element, um, kind of that needs to be informed by environmental review. So we can't make a decision on you know, where housing should go until and unless we have kind of studied that. And so at the higher level, 30,000 feet, the, the council is discussing um, what are, we're terming CEQA scenarios. And so what the, the, um, the plan is to study a, a number which would, um, that the ultimate plan would fall beneath. And so it would be kind of an umbrella or a, uh, an overarching bubble, which would be, which would exceed um, what we need to actually plan for, but would allow us then the flexibility through this GPAC process, working with the community to figure out where to essentially um, push, pull, um, raise, lower within that overall, um, what we're terming a, a maximum case scenario. And I should clarify, hang on a second, Jeremy, I should clarify that uh, Greg meant April 12th, not August 12th. Did I say August 12th? He did. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just to clarify, essentially what you're saying is that the GPAC will not be able to upzone anywhere that the city council does not first approve studying. Like this process, the city council gets final say, but the city council also gets, they get to set the parameters 
of where it can be upslipped um, by deciding where the environmental impact consultant studies. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, maybe with very small exception, but the, the idea being that the, the, what the environmental uh, consultant would study would um, essentially be a bubble within which the, the GPAC and ultimately city. Yeah, 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 I understand. I'm saying so the, they, the city tells the environmental impact consultant study, and then they study areas, and then the GPAC, it's not that they're all up, so I understand that, but the GPAC then gets to decide given the areas that the city council instructed the EIR consultant to study, um, that's where they're allowed to look at. So if, if the city council in the end were to decide that they wanted to up, up zone a different area of town, which had not been previously studied, additional environmental review would have to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm asking a different question, but I'll, I'll shoot you an email and we, and we can we can answer it that way. I'm also, I, I just really, actually, I, I'll email you my other question. I've taken up enough time, but thank you very much. Thank you, welcome. Thanks for the question. So next we'll bring in Brian Pardo. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Brian Pardo. Um, I live on Glen Road. And I had a question, I guess it's about procedure. Um, at a GPAC meeting in February, I was left with the impression that the public would be um, <clears throat> engaged to provide feedback on what sort of vision they would like for Lafayette moving forward. Um, they have an opportunity to comment on um, opportunity zones or opportunity sites. And they would also have an opportunity to, to frame the rubric or the, the evaluation tool that would be used to evaluate each of these opportunity sites. Um, and once that was done, um, GPAC would take all that data and sort of form it into a, a recommendation that we pass to city council. So if my understanding is correct, I'm a little concerned because at the city council meeting on Monday, uh, the mayor wanted to take a vote with the city council uh, to send several studies, I think they're termed CEQA studies, uh, to the environmental consultant for um, a review, basically to kick that process off. Um, but my concern is that that effort, which ultimately failed, um, would have short-circuited the public comments and the public feedback, as well as give um, momentum to some scenarios that weren't formed on the basis of public opinion. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious if you have any comments about that. Thanks. Well, I'm happy to, uh, I, I think I spoke to that, um, the, the process um, that the council is in the process of discussing. Um, basically that what we're terming sequence scenarios of, of this, these kind of the maximum case scenario being the, the, um, the, the project that would be studied in the greatest amount of detail. And, and as we discussed with a previous um, commenter about the, the impact that it would have um, on the environment, inclusive of city services and, and um, infrastructure. Um, and then, so and through this GPAC process. So I think your understanding was, was correct that through this process that we are currently engaged in and will we'll continue through, um, we will, GPAC will ultimately be bringing forward and recommending um, to the Planning Commission City Council a, a, a plan, a housing element and, and up zoning where, where found uh, ultimately appropriate. So I, I, think I guess there's... my, I guess my concern, I'm sorry. I guess my concern is that these high elevation plans or CEQA studies that the city council is starting to frame give momentum to scenarios that just don't come from the public, that they're being created by other people in the back room. And that those, those grandiose 10,000 foot plans just aren't public opinion. And they're, they're framing public opinion before the public has an opportunity to actually give their opinion. 
So I think the thing that we can clarify here is that we will be talking more specifically, but right now we're defining the, the, the envelope in which we need, we can work and get that public feedback. So we will be putting forward, we will be putting forward tools with which the public can tell us, oh, I think we can upzone here, but I think we could do a lower density here. And that's the feedback that will be used to identify the specific areas to be upzoned, but the CEQA analysis, uh, we, we will be working within that. So like Greg said, it's the maximum possible. And so that's not, I think you understand that we're not planning to up, up zone everything in those uh, scenarios, right? But we will be working through a public process to define where the community wants to put those units. Does that clarify it a little bit? And it clarifies it in the sense that you are limiting the public's engagement or the ability for the public to comment. Um, I'm going to disagree with that statement that um, th there is no limitation on, and, and frankly, this tonight is an example of us going quite contrary to that, is that we do want to educate, we do want to inform, and we do want your feedback to inform the final plan. Um, we do also have statutory requirements to adhere to. Um, we must meet the, the, the law or um, contend with the consequences. And so we have a deadline of January, 2023 to have an approved housing element as does every jurisdiction in the Bay Area. Uh, we also have the requirement to do environmental analysis which takes many months to do. And so thus the, the overarching study within which we can as a community pick and choose and decide on the, on the best option to move forward. Um, nothing in the environmental review would preclude um, the, the a decision of the, of the city council later on. And it may be the case that additional environmental review would need to be done because a, a um, something they, they want to make a decision that uh, hasn't previously been studied. It would require that additional environmental review because CEQA requires um, that the project be, that, that the decision makers be informed what the impacts of that would be. So no decision or direction at this point in time is going to ultimately uh, preclude, dictate anything later on. Um, you, we, we can theoretically always go back and do additional environmental review, but we do have the deadlines to deal with. And so that's, that's part of the struggle. Thanks. For your so question. then, thank you. So then if the public, if there was an overwhelming um, public consensus that there should be opportunity sites evaluated in say Release Valley, for example, Release Valley wasn't included in any of those CEQA studies. Could those opportunity sites be evaluated at a later date? Yes. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So next we'll bring in Patty Battersby. Um, and just as a reminder, if you do wanna ask a question, please raise your hand. Uh, if you're calling in, use the star nine function. Um, we are approaching the halfway, we are at the halfway point for the Q and A. Um, and we do have seven folks asking, wanting to ask questions. So please do try to keep them brief so we can get to everybody. Um, however, if you do have a question after this session, we have a Q&A function on Engagement HQ enabled. So you can leave a question there and we will uh, do our best to get back to you quickly. Uh, and that answer will be public to everyone there. Uh, Patty, you are in the meeting. If you would like to unmute and ask your question. I think I'm in now. Um, my question is I live in the Glen and um, we have, uh, creeks and pond, very deep pond, um, that carry all the water off of the, the Briones and all the canyons that the Glen backs up to. And my question is that if a property on north of Deer Hill were to be chosen and it's in a flood zone or it's on Happy Valley Creek, is there any way would a developer be allowed to uh, culvert the creek? 
it's a very hard hypothetical to uh, answer yes or no to, but certainly the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, if not the uh, arm, the the Federal um, Corps of Engineers, um, would get involved. And so there there are significant protections afforded to uh, waterways and riparian areas. Um, so I, I I can't answer that, but um, it, it would be difficult, I'll, I will say that. Okay, that's helpful because some of the, the lots on, particularly on North Thompson are very, very narrow and the property goes into the creek. So I think that's a great concern uh, for many of us. So thank you for trying to answer that. All right, thank you, Patty. Next, we will hear from Libby Henry. Hi, Libby, you're in the meeting if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Okay, there I am. Um, so I wanted to ask, and I've had discussions with Greg about this before, um, the arena numbers. Now, is are those something that uh, the GPAC or I don't know what the planning commission, um, they don't seem very reasonable to me, particularly when you compare it to, for example, Arinda or Moraga, you know, our neighbors. Um, I mean, this is five times over five times what our previous one was. And I'm just wondering, is there a process or is there a contact to, you know, question where did they come up with these numbers for Lafayette? And um, I mean, I remember that, I guess it was in November, they said 1600 and, you know, in one month it jumped up 500 when everybody assumed it was gonna go down actually. And I, I'm, it's just, um, I don't, I don't know if there's any part of the general plan, you know, committee that, you know, looks at these things or any part of the, you know, departments in, in the city of Lafayette that, um, that's Diana. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to answer that one. Um, the, the numbers were allocated as was shown in the, in the PowerPoint that Jonathan shared the the allocation for the Bay area of 441,000 units was allocated to ABAG and ABAG's job, which is, and was, is to uh, distribute them amongst all the jurisdictions in the Bay Area. And they convened a housing methodology committee, which is made up of representatives of every county, stakeholders and others, that it wasn't specifically uh, ABAG that came up with the methodology, although they provided the technical support for that. It was HCD, right? No, the HCD brought the, brought, it sent the, uh, the units to uh, ABAG and ABAG um, distributed them through the housing methodology committee. At this point, the reason it went up uh, was because some changes were made uh, based on some equity concerns about certain jurisdictions that have, and it, I should mention, and Lafayette wasn't really one of them, that concerns about um, equity and uh, historically segregated um, populations. And so there's a, a variety of jurisdictions that actually received a lot more units, but they did actually add some uh, additional um, uh, um, factors included in that that would focus more on um, accessibility specifically to transit and because there's a BART station in Lafayette that's a big reason why those numbers went up. Now that methodology we're talking about 2114 units at the moment this right. is not a, this is not an official number but it's what we have to run with right now in order to keep moving with the, in the timeframes that we have statutorily required. And so what happens is that um, when the state approves what ABAG did as a distribution, then we'll get our so-called official draft number, which should be sometime this spring. And we assume it's probably gonna be the same number, 2114. At that time, each jurisdiction can then appeal the process appeal it based on local factors that maybe uh, the city feels like they that were not taken into consideration. 
Um, and, but, and at that point, those, um, those appeals throughout the Bay Area will be adjudicated over the summer and we'll, by next fall, we'll have our final numbers. So there's definitely opportunity to push back. There's been opportunities that we've been involved very extensively since the beginning of the housing methodologies committee's work to say what what's important for the city of Lafayette. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so there is an opportunity. Um, is there any way that um, because I'm I'm doing a lot of research on on this. Is there any way that I can get contact information of who? I mean, who is our a bag representative, and and you know how do you contact that person? And because I've tried to and not gotten any response. We can definitely um, get back to you on that. If you would please send an, an email to the general plan email address requesting that, we sure. can certainly make that happen. Okay, and um, um, oh brother, <laughs> I had it on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> Um, well, I guess I just lost it. Uh, you can always email us a question. That's fine. Yeah. Or we could take another question. If it comes back to you, you can raise your hand again. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Libby. So next we'll bring in Paul Cavanaugh. Oh, did it come to you, Libby? All right. We'll bring her back in. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, so I live in, on Glen. I, I have a house on Glen Road. And uh, I, I think um, I'm looking for a little straight talk, which I think would help everybody. Uh, I understand most of the proposed plans heavily rely on Deer Hill and the BART parking lots and the BART property to get to that magic number over 2000 units. Um, it seems to me as a layman who doesn't know the slightest thing about city planning that this to avoid um, too much uh, pressure on our infrastructure to uh, avoid too much environmental impact, so on and so forth. The proximity to the BART station and the proximity to the on ramps and off ramps makes um, Deer Hill uh, development almost a given, almost a, an absolute given with no other competing uh, plans of that scope in order to provide those units. So my question is, is there any other large scale development, uh, large scale approval being considered, or is it pretty much mostly going to be BART and Deer Hill? Uh, no, I mean, we're not, definitely not to the, to that level. I, I know that the mayor has, has uh, asked specifically for for a study that as part of the CEQA study, looking at putting all the units that are required in the downtown, the existing downtown corridor, excluding uh, BART and excluding Deer Hill. But all those kinds of questions won't, re we really won't have an answer for any of that until such time as we understand what the impacts of each one of these potential um, CEQA scenarios would come up with. So again, like Greg said, we're going to look at a very large number and then use that as sort of a way to cut away and move things around and decide what the best uh, final, you know, uh, alternative is for the city. Okay. I'd like to to step back and clarify that no plans have, aside from the proposed sequence scenarios, no plans have been approved and yes. we haven't identified specific locations for development or even upzoning that will be done through a public process. So I just want to be as clear as possible. And I, I understand I understand that is the, the diplomatic answer and I appreciate that. Uh, the thing is though, as I said, even somebody who knows nothing about city planning, I can see the impact to infrastructure, putting it downtown would be so much more extreme than putting it right around BART and on Deer Hill. Um, am I incorrect in assuming that? We don't know. We don't know what the impacts will be. So I, All you right. know, since it's not really a question, may you please put that in as a comment um, uh, that would be helpful for people, other people to see. And Jonathan at the end will actually talk about how to make comments like that. We don't know what the impacts are. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. So next we'll bring in Ann Hawkins. Right, Anne, you are in the meeting if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. 
Okay, I've been on before. Um, and one of the questions I had asked was, um, well, I'm going to get to that later. I'm wondering if you guys have started getting the sense that many people feel this is too many housing units for the size of our city. Um, and uh, many of us are concerned because we already have um, housing that hasn't been finished. And once that is finished, there's gonna be um, a huge impact on our traffic. So then when that happens, and then we have to put all these more units in, again, it's gonna be further impact. Would any of you be willing to help with an appeal to uh, Rena and an appeal for, to that mandate? I think that, you know, it's a statutory requirement. That's a question that it would be best posed for the city council. You know, staff's charge is really to uh, make it work. Um, and the consequences of not having a certified housing element are very dire, could be very dire for the city. And so if the, there is an effort to, to appeal the process, et cetera, we have to continue on as before. So I, I think that your best bet is to, to make a pitch to the city council um, and or make comments on uh, the, the, some of the engagement HQ section. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then the other question I had is, um, last time I asked about developers, um, assuming we're gonna have to have some amount of housing and hopefully there, uh, we can appeal the amount of housing they're now suggesting. But um, assuming we are gonna have to put some housing in, um, the person who responded, I think he just left to a meeting, but he mentioned that we, we don't have control or you don't have control over who the developers would be. Right. And um, I wanted to hear more about that because it seems to mm -hmm. me that the best way for Lafayette to have um, housing units put in place that would be keep the integrity of the city, but also um, you know, accomplish what we're trying to accomplish would be to have people who are truly invested, that they they live in this area and they they truly do, are, are, they're not there for financial gain nearly so much as they want this city to be as beautiful and as functioning as the rest of us who live here. So is, I know he said you can't um, choose your developers, but why is that? And is there a way that we could, change that so that we could make sure the people who are building in our town really will do the very best they can to make it look and feel like Lafayette has changed only for the better. Well, let's go back to the sort of uh, 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 the beginning here is the job of the city is to create the environment in which development can occur. It is does not build housing. It does not have funds to build housing, nor does it tell developers what to do. The decision to develop will always be remain with the owner of the property. If the owner of the property wants to develop it, it's their responsibility to, to, to find, do their due diligence, get their own developer or whatever. And then they have to make a pitch to the city in the form of an application if they're going to do that. So basically the only control the city has is what it does through zoning, through incentives for um, giving like affordable housing, uh, fast track processing, things like that. That's all really a city can do. So in the sense of, of developer, since uh, we, could dis we could say these sites look great for development, but if the owner doesn't want to develop it, it's not going to get developed. Just because we are creating the possibility for development of 2,100 units absolutely does not mean that 2,100 units will be built. Oh, okay. Okay. That I, I was misunderstanding that. So the, what, what you're saying now makes it very clear to me that this is based on the people who own property. You, you're doing all your background research. You're trying to find out what the public likes and people are giving suggestions. And if we're going to have to put this many units, this is how it would look good. And this is where it would be less environmental impact. Correct. But at the end of the day, you could do all this planning and everybody who owns these properties where you have said this is where it should happen, they say we don't want to develop and then no units happen. That's exactly right. Oh, okay. Didn't know that. Okay. And I, within your question, I heard a, a 
a bit about the community character as well. So all developments are still subject to our design guidelines that we um, have in place. And that's, that's a current practice and it can be a practice moving forward. So those are kind of the architectural and more stylistic um, development practices that you know make up the Lafayette character and those would still apply to future yeah. development. Because so. I've spoken to many people who will say, oh my goodness, it's so hard to remodel or whatever because Lafayette's so strict. So in that way, I guess we, we would be protected from some kind of units that wouldn't uh, flow with the character. Um, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. I'm glad I, I clicked tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank yes. you. And we will bring in Cheryl McDonald next. Hi, Cheryl, you are in the meeting if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Okay, um, I have a few questions. One um, mostly probably goes to Diana. Um, I was at a GPAC meeting, I assume it was this year, um, and where we talked about ADUs. And I thought um, at that meeting, there was the discussion that she had done an inventory and that we were able to count ADUs five years back. And it was just an approximation because she, there was no way to account for every single ADU in Lafayette um, and that she was looking at listings and things like that. So I wanted to know if I got that right or if no. I misunderstood. <laughs> close, okay. you're very close. Oh, well, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> what, what it is is that we look at what the actual trends were for the last five years and averaged them. So if it's been over the last five years, an average of 20 units per year, the average has been built or permitted and built, then we can count 20 units per year going forward starting in 2023. So then over the eight year cycle, that's 160 units. It's not that we can count what actually happened, but that we can project forward what likely will happen. I so hope you're that not makes better sense. So you're, you're not able to count from the past. No. It's, it's just, okay, oops, boy. Some clicking is happening today. Well, it would count towards the last housing element. It just won't count towards this this upcoming one. Oh, because they were already built then. Yeah. I got that part. Okay. Um, so that's cool. All right. And that the numbers are going up. And then um, I, I is, did I, oh, Greg left. Um, other people, Jonathan, maybe you guys can help. Um, or you were there. The last city council meeting, uh, did Ken Burks, council member Burks um, ask that, uh, how to fight, we brought back to the April 12th city council meeting and maybe the rest of the people that are on this meeting would wanna to come to that. Is that, was that to come back along with the scenarios? Uh, we're, I think so, yes. I've, um, I don't know, Renata and Jonathan, do you know? I, I rewatched the meeting after the fact and um, it sounded like that was the direction. Okay. Yeah, I heard Mayor Kandel say that she was going to add a future agenda item uh, to talk about different ways that the city could um, push back. Right. Okay. All right. All right. You cleared up a couple of things. I, I just like that other color. I lost my third one, so I'll raise my hand if it comes back. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Cheryl. All right. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Next, we'll bring in Samantha Carter. Hi, Samantha, you're in the meetings. Please unmute and ask your question. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so my question, um, I live in Happy Valley Glen and we kind of back up to, you know, essentially what's Brioni's and, you know, the kind of wild lands that behind our property, um, which makes us very concerned about uh, wildfires and very aware of the fact that we have the designation of the very high fire hazard severity zone. And my question is, how does that designation play into this process? It becomes a choice for the city uh, to make that uh, make the determination of specifically, let's talk about the BART site. The city specifically can decide not to put units on the BART site, not upzone it as required by state law because it's a high fire danger area, very high fire danger area. So, but those units that would have been on that site, let's say it's 800 units or however we, whatever the number is, uh, roughly speaking, they'd have to go somewhere else in the community. It's not that, you know, we just 
lop off and say, oh, we can't build in here. We have to actually build it somewhere. So it may go to some other location within the jurisdiction. And this is actually, you know, I had a conversation with folks at ABAG and MTC about this very issue. And they said that they have the expectation that if a jurisdiction doesn't want to build in it, it's high fire zones, then it, that it will find other locations within the jurisdictions that are outside of that zone to build. But it's all the, ultimately the choice is still the cities. And I will also okay. add that wildfire risk and mitigation is also a, a part of CEQA review, so California Environmental Quality Act review right. for developments. So that is a, a kind of baked in consideration. Okay, so basically not only does the city have the opportunity to address it, but then it is going to be a part of the environmental review that happens. Yes, correct. Okay, and out of curiosity, I don't really know if you can answer this, but I mean, is it, <laughs> the number is so huge and, you know, uh, for the allocation and obviously, I mean, it seems so easy to be like, oh my gosh, we can get over 800 units in the BART parking lots. Like we have to do it. And, you know, which I can understand when you're trying to attack this giant number but the fact that it's in a high fire zone it just feels like it that's not maybe given the weight or gravity that i would expect it to be given given the you know risk of a major fire in the zone and it's hard to understand for me to understand how we could be talking about putting that level of development at the base of a neighborhood that has 130 homes with one ingress and egress. Like it's just, it's not making any sense to me. That's a great comment to put on our engagement HQ. I don't think I have, any of us have really a reply to that, but definitely it would be helpful for you to make that comment. It's, okay. we, we've definitely heard a lot of concern about wildfire risk and it is an ongoing part of the conversation. Um, so as we mentioned before, we are in the information phase and we'll be, bringing all of these different elements that have been brought up, like mixed use development in the downtown, wildfire mitigation, those kinds of um, different perspectives into the into our considerations as a community. Um, but yes, if you wanna put on the ideas, well, we really encourage that. Um, it's a way for us to, it's a kind of a starting point for us to then uh, pull from for those community conversations. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you, Samantha. So next we will bring in Joe Beck. Hi, Joe, you are in the meeting if you would like to unmute and ask your question. You are currently muted, Joe. I've asked, asked you. you. There you are. There, you are. Oh, sorry. I wanted, first, I wanted to thank you all for the hard work that you're doing. Um, this is an incredibly challenging pro process. So my, my question is, uh, it has to do with A, B, 686, uh, which basically requires that affordable units be spread around the city to overcome patterns of segregation. Mm -hmm. um, is the, are the planning uh, folks uh, able to get their arms around this one and, and get it into the process? Because it sort of goes, um, it has to be balanced with other needs uh, like um, proximity to transportation and all of that. But basically AB 686 is very clear about um, in order to overcome patterns of segregation, um, you, we should be sp spreading the affordable units around town. Well, well it's just, it's just a spreading the affordable units. Unit. It's also, it's also, it's locating units where there, there are highest, the highest, highest resources. resources. So we haven't gotten to that analysis yet about where any of those units would go. That's something that will come later on. Uh, but you're right, I mean, uh, AB 626 is really important for us to look at. For those of you who may not know, this is a new law that um, requires, is to ensure that housing isn't put into neighborhoods where either additional um, uh, displacement could occur or in, in neighborhoods that are historically low income that they should be that, that people in, in, 
in, in affordable housing ha enjoy the same benefits and amenities that other people do in the community. But we're not there yet. So, but um, we'll be we'll looking at that. Basically, uh, basically it, it requires that, um, that, if, that affordable housing, that low cost housing not all be in the same area in order to avoid patterns of segregation. And it seems like you would need to consider this early on rather, rather than after you've made dis potential decisions. That's a, That's a great comment and I just to go on H Engagement HQ and put it down. That's an important thing for us to consider. Thank you. So we will be providing a brief demo um, shortly on Engagement HQ. So I think we'll take one more a uh, question from Christina, who has not had a chance to speak tonight, and then we'll uh, do our little wrap up. Thank you, Joe. Hi, Christina, you are in the meeting, if you would like Thank to ask your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, my question just really, my question is what, um, sorry, it's so dark. Uh, What's what counts? Where's the deadline? Where's the start and stop of new housing? Because there's a lot of housing that's going on now, right? Um, and you know, it's some of it's just a hole in the ground. Do we get credit for that, or is this 2023 onward? Uh, that goes to how much impact we're really talking about, right? And actually, that's a great question, and I appreciate you asking it because actually, there is any even though the the, the housing element starts the day basically that the, the city adopts it, which is ja basically January 2023. There is a six month lag here that if if a project in that's currently under construction or going to be under construction, it does not have its is not basically habitable yet, or it what we call it is it doesn't get its certificate of occupancy until after. June 30th, 2022, we can count that towards our RENA allocation for the sixth cycle. Um, if, if the completion of the project happens before that date, it goes to the last housing element, the fifth cycle housing element as production. So yes, there are many of these things that are under, under construction may not, may be able to be uh, accounted towards this, the sixth cycle. How are we doing on the fifth cycle and how many units are where there's holes being dug now are we talking about? So how far if they aren't uh, occupancy ready on that January 2023, how mm -hmm. many are we talking about? That I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sure staff could probably get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, so we are currently preparing our annual report to the state. That is how we update them on our progress. Um, so that will be going to both Planning Commission and City Council this spring. Um, so we'll have more information soon. <laughs> All right. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. So if you had a question that we did not get to tonight, um, or if anything comes up in the future, please feel free to write us an email at generalplan at lovelafayette.org, or use the Q&A function on Engagement HQ, which I think Jonathan will show shortly. Um, so we really appreciate your time and I'll kick it back to Jonathan. All right, let's start off with um, e-notifications because uh, tonight we are joined by uh, Chris Lee and Mike Kim who are on the General Plan Advisory Committee. And GPAC is the group that was uh, created specifically to lead the city through the general plan and the housing element. They'll be charged with um, taking in public comment and forming recommendations for the planning commission and the city council. So it's important that uh, if you're interested in the process um, to tune into those meetings. So if uh, starting on the city's webpage, lovelafayette.org, we can navigate to city hall and then e-notifications. And once we're on this page, there's a, a few items of information that we'll need email address, uh, first, last name. Then you can click on general plan update and then submit, enter the code, then submit. Once you fill out this form, you'll get automatic updates whenever there's a meeting involving the general plan. So important to stay up to date with information. 
Next is um, the website that is dedicated to all things general plan. And that's planlafayette.org. This is our hub for all the information about the general plan and each of the individual elements. So a bunch of great resources here. We have uh, a library with resources, um, uh, general plan, downtown specific plan, our previous housing element. We have frequently asked questions and answers about the general plan and housing element. We have action uh, minutes from our previous general plan meetings. And also we have uh, a direct link to our engagement platform, Engagement HQ. So this is our digital engagement platform that will have all of our weekly activities and opportunities for the public to um, uh, participate um, and give input and provide ideas. So I'll go over a couple of those right now. So if we scroll down, um, we have the Q&A function like Renata mentioned. If you have a question that you didn't get to ask or wanna ask it in digital form, feel free to ask a question, leave it there and everyone can see those questions and answers. And also if you have more of a comment or an idea about housing as it relates to um, the housing element or specifically Akalani's Valley and Happy Valley, feel free to drop it on the ideas wall. Um, and you can leave an idea like uh, many of the ideas that we already have. So we look forward to you attending our general plan meetings and um, enjoying the activities on Engagement HQ. So we'll pass it over to our committee members to close us out. I would just like to do one last plug. Um, we are planning community workshops, uh, I believe in towards later spring. So if you sign up for those e-notifications, you will be alerted, but we will also be getting the word out in many other ways. So it's not the only way, but it is one key tool that we are using. Thank you, uh, back to you all. <laughs> Hi, well, I'll just uh, thank everybody who attended tonight and uh, thank everyone who had a question. Um, GPAC is really a, a citizen committee. We're going to be together for four years. Uh, this first year, uh, we're tackling probably the hardest issue. So we are becoming educated. Our meetings are extremely educational if you'd like to tune in. We're having them twice a month now for the next period of time because there's uh, so much to do and so much to learn. So our next meeting is on March 16th at six o'clock. Please tune in. There are public comments allowed after every discussion item. So you'll have a chance to uh, say your piece. Uh, we also have another neighborhood meeting, but you can join it if, even if you don't live in that neighborhood. Uh, next Thursday, the um, Release Valley meeting is on uh, March 18th, hosted by Jim Cervantes, who is uh, vice chair of the committee. And I really enjoy going to Engagement HQ and leaving some comments. After 25 years, I'm still discovering new places in Lafayette. I took a hike through Batwing last weekend and had to talk about it on Engagement HQ. So please use that. Tell us what you're thinking about. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. And again, thank you for being here. Uh, Chris, do you wanna mention the survey? Uh, yes, the uh, when, the, when, the, um, when this meeting ends, your browser, look at your browser and you will see an instant survey. And tomorrow within probably 24 hours of tonight's meeting, uh, you'll be getting an email survey. And please, uh, I, I've looked at uh, results from previous meeting surveys and they are very, very helpful for us to be able to present the best kind of meeting that we can that will meet uh, your needs. So please fill out the survey. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Mike, any parting words? No, thank you. I think um, Chris did a great job and just want to say thank you again for everybody's participation and um, uh, please stay engaged. Have a great night. All right. Thank you.